Philippi as we start with Proverbs 11.30, and it says, He who wins souls is wise. Say with me. He who wins souls is wise. He who wins souls is wise. So what do we want to be? No. We want to be soul winners. We want to be soul winners. The wisdom part is the, the blessing that God gives on those who win souls. And uh, I, it's amazing. I always heard my dad speak and like others, I've seen them witness and testify of their kids. And I'm trying to teach my kids to live out their faith already. And so I always tell Patey, Patey, tell someone that Jesus loves them. Tell someone that Jesus loves them. And uh, we were on holiday and we got back on Wednesday. But Tuesday night we went to fill up, um, uh, uh, fill up with fuel and cry as you see that number climb and uh, as we were doing that I went I ran in and I said come let's get a coke for the petrol tent and so we got a coke and I said Peter you go give it to him and tell him Jesus loves him she goes oh, dad and I said you tell him tell him Jesus loves him and she goes okay and she takes the coke and, and I stood on the other side of the car she walks around and she goes uncle thank you so much Jesus loves you and I was watching from the other side, and this man, oh man, I'm worse. Yo. Um, he stood there and he went, thank you. And then he walked around the car to me and he says, I'm a believer, I love Jesus, but you have no idea how much I needed to hear that. Isn't it important to take prophetic words, God's word, into situations? That people need to hear from God. People need to hear from Jesus, the word of God, that he loves them. Today we're diving into a topic that often sparks a lot of controversy and that is difficult to see, I think, exercised in a way that honors and pleases God at times because um, it can so often, we can run ahead of ourselves and make, try and make ourselves look good when we see the fruit of this ministry, and, uh, but it's one that sparks a lot of curiosity as well. And it's that beautiful word, prophet. Prophet, to prophesy. That's a difficult one. Because <laughs> do we see it enough in our own lives, through our own lives, through the local church, out of the local church? So we're continuing with this divine interventions part where we're looking through God's prophets. And Hebrews 1 verse 1 to 2 says, In the past God spoke through our ancestors, through the prophets at many times and in various ways, but in these last days He's spoken to us by His Son. Now, does that mean He only speaks through the words of Jesus, or does that mean He majority, most of the time spoke through the prophets, but that He can still speak through them today? And we're going to explore but today about how God intervenes through prophetic words and the relevance of those words and the spoken word of God into situations and how it can change not only a person's life, but our own lives. But we have to understand divine intervention as well. And divine intervention is God stepping into human history to guide, correct, and assist his people. And so do we see divine intervention? Many times we see divine intervention. And some scriptural examples is through Exodus, the call of Moses through the burning bush. And it's an event that marks this significant intervention. And God directly communicates with Moses, calling him to lead Israelites out of Egypt. And it's a powerful symbol, this burning bush of the holy presence of God and the deliverance of God's people. How God chose to use an ordinary man, Moses the shepherd, a simple man, with a troubled past for a divine purpose. And then in the book of Kings, and you look at Elijah and Elisha and these different prophets that God used throughout the times there. And how it was, and the narrative showcases God's intervention and Elijah's bold challenge to the prophets of Baal and the miracles then that God performed. And it just reaffirms God's power and the importance of our faithfulness to Him. But standing firm in what we believe God's saying to us. In a world filled with many distractions, many false ideas, false idols. But it's always a call when I read through Elijah's life to trust God's power, to trust his work, his word. And to see it work against all odds. God will always remain victorious. And then the life of Jonah. 
And many people just think, oh, the whale. But it's about his life and Jonah's call to Nineveh. But it's actually about also God's mercy and his willingness to offer repentance to people. That's the whole crux of it is God sending a rebellious man who refuses to go to a people who he wants to save. And it comes out of Jonah's reluctance, eventually compliance to really listen to what God is saying and results in a people being saved. But these Old Testament prophets um, were incredible. They were instruments used by God. What was the role of them? What was the role of the prophets? It was, they were messengers of God, guiding and correcting his people. Prophets were not just predictors about the future, but they were God's spokespeople. They were tasked with delivering messages to God's people, revealing God's word, God's word to people. So as we look at revealing God's word, these messengers, Moses was a deliverer, a lawgiver, taking God's word to people. And Moses' life is a testament to God's direct intervention in human affairs. It's about this miraculous little baby boy who is preserved to the leadership that he took over Exodus, over the Exodus. Moses' life was filled with these divine, amazing encounters. Moses' life for me teaches me to trust in God's plan and his timing. I'm sure when he was shepherding in, in the bush and uh, just the way, I don't know if he felt that he was walking in the will of God or not. I'm not drawing that conclusion. But it was about God pulling him out of the season that he was in, preparing him for the season that he was for, using his inadequacies and equipping him and empowering him for purposes. Elijah was, de demonstrated the power of God over false gods. His confrontation over the prophets of Baal and his dramatic display of God's power was just amazing. But it was his unwavering faith as well, his belief in the, 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 the miracles that happened. His life was marked by many miracles and the provision during famine and the resurrection of even a widow's son. Elijah's boldness in confronting falsehood inspires me many times when I look at it and go, how can I stand up against what's wrong? It shows that God supports those who are faithful, even in the face of overwhelming opposition. Isaiah's life, one of the other major prophets in the Bible, foretold the coming of the Messiah. Isaiah's prophecies are foundational to our understanding of the coming of Christ, about his suffering, about who would bear the sins of the world, and gave us so much and gives us so much insight to God's redemptive plan. Isaiah's prophecies remind us of God's long-term plan for salvation through Jesus Christ, and they encourage us to look beyond our immediate circumstances to the ultimate fulfillment of God's promises. When I look at all these instances, that are, and there's so many more, there's minor prophets, major prophets, people who delivered the word of God. What can we learn from some of their lives? And there's just three simple lessons that I want to draw out. But one of them is an obedience to God's calling. Like prophets like Moses, Isaiah, Elijah, Elisha, demonstrated an answer to God's call despite personal inadequacies or fears. Moses being one who stutters and speaks on behalf of a nation and sees a nation set free, setting aside his own fear to allow God to use him. There's also a boldness in proclaiming the message of God Elijah and his fearless confrontations with false prophets and teachers. And the, his boldness to speak God's truth with courage. And then faithfulness despite oppositions. Prophets office often faced rejection, persecution, isolation. And they often demonstrated just an unwavering commitment to God's message. And this inspires me, I know when I read it, to think, Lord, how do you want to use me in today's context? How do you, you want to speak through me? How do you want my life to shine? I'm like, Lord, I, want, I need to be bold. I need to be unwavering in faith. 
I need to be able to walk into situations even if I'm uncomfortable and confront things and allow you to use me. But there's a big transition in the New Testament prophets. And you see almost the shift of this prophetic role from this foretelling in the Old Testament to kind of a fourth telling. Foretelling is predicting the future events that were currently not known, telling people stories like Isaiah about the coming of a Christ. And in the New Testament, this fourth telling, this knowing, this knowledge of Jesus Christ and proclaiming and declaring his message into situations, speaking his life into our present issues, offering guidance that we know from Scripture now, having the Word of God or exhorting people. And there's many examples, even in the New Testament. John the Baptist, he was the last Old Testament prophet, a forerunner before Christ in Matthew chapter 3. Agabus, how many of you know Agabus? Okay, I was just made up that word to see if you know. <laughs> no, I'm joking. The book of Acts. The book of Acts. Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 21. He prophesied the famine that they, were, that they were going to experience. He prophesied about Paul's imprisonment. And he prepared Paul for that. And I often think, Paul, why didn't you run away then? <laughs> There's a spoken word of God into your life about a situation you're going to experience. And you ran into it. But Paul knew what he was doing. But what was the purpose of these prophetic words and how do we define prophecy today and how do we learn from prophecy and how, how do we experience it? Then we have to look at Scripture always because everything has to be weighed up in the measurement of Scripture. So I brought a big Bible because then the word is weighty. No, I'm joking. It's, it's amazing. We have to draw from the Word of God to understand these things. We have to always go to the Word of God and say, Lord, how do we see what's the purpose of prophecy? What's the purpose of an apostle? What's the purpose of a shepherd? What's the purpose? And we see that in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 3, it's the building up, encouraging, and comforting of the church. The upbuilding, encouragement, comforting, consolation. These are the gifts that God, the, the purpose of them. All of them. And so what is the relevance of the prophetic in today's church? Well, there's this continuity of the prophetic ministry, the spoken word of God, being messengers of God, taking his message to people, speaking it into situations. See, it's not always about this, mm, I've got this word, flowers from your ears and chocolate ice cream. But it's about taking the spoken word of God and speaking it into situations and believing that God would do things with that because we know that his word will never return back void. And so I know that people who don't know Christ need to hear John 3 verse 16, that Christ died for them. And I speak it prophetically into their lives that the, the, the spoken word of God being a messenger of his word that he wants to save them and set them free. And there's power in speaking the word of God. And so there is a function for the prophetic in the modern day church. And there's the gifts of prophecy. Ephesians 4 verse 11. We can't negate these. Ephesians 4 verse 11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry. For the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed and fro by waves. See, all of that is for the local church. It's intimidating. I know that I always, I hate a lot of the Christianese that we can speak. And sometimes you say, oh, prophet. And the sad part is you see all this, the terrible examples around. But with bad examples, that means there has to, if there's a counterfeit, there has to be an original, a, a, a real. There's only counterfeit money because there's real money. 
But God gives these gifts, and the gifts aren't just gifts, they're people that God places in the church. Shepherds. I mean, it's all the same sentence. He gives, he, God gives. God gives, and that, that word uh, gave or gives is didomi. My Greek and Hebrew is terrible, so please forgive me. But it means to grant, to make, to minister, to have power, to receive, to set apart, to take, to utter, to yield. So he gives the people who are called to be the evangelists, prophets, shepherds, teachers, apostles, the abilities to equip the saints. Who are the saints? The people of God. The people of God for the work of ministry. And I love it. Many people always say, oh, um, you guys should do that. You guys should do this. You guys should do this. And I'm like, great. So when are you going to do it? When do you want to do it? You know, we should really see this happen in the local church. Great. How do you want to do it? Let's help equip you for the work of ministry. If you see a gap, let's fill it. Let's not tear it apart. Let's fill the gaps so that we can hold what God has for us. But we as the church and as the believers, we need to do a few things. And one of them is to use discernment to test prophetic words, prophecies against Scripture. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 20 to 21. We have to use discernment. And many of us have to grow in discernment. We'll touch on how we do this, but, but the, the gift of prophecy and the prophet is for encouragement, guidance, for comfort. And so I'm excited. I want to see it operate more. The spoken word of God through the messengers of God to encourage, equip the saints. To see us built up more. It's for guidance. To seek God's will so that we understand His voice. Knowing exactly what the Word of God is telling us and sometimes getting an utterance just for a little bit of divine perspective or revelation in that way. But He gives us power to equip the church. To equip all of us for works of service. And this passage highlights in Ephesians 4 that these offices, the prophet, apostle, the teacher, the evangelist, all of these things here are people that God has given us to help us grow and mature. That's what it says. So we can grow and mature and not be tossed around to and fro. So we need them. We need them. Otherwise, we're going to be tossed around. I mean, the same can be said. If we don't have them, then we will be tossed around to and fro. That we won't mature. That we won't reach unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 28 to 30, Paul lists prophets alongside teachers and apostles and other important roles that God has given the church to show that they're an integral to the church's function. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 3 to 5 explains that prophecy is meant to strengthen, encourage, and comfort the church. Strengthen, encourage, and comfort. And the prophetic and the prophetic prophet role is a crucial role in building up the community by speaking God's message. And so even today, as we speak God's message, you can receive this as a prophetic word into your life. That man, the petrol attendant, that was a prophetic word that my daughter spoke into his life that he needed to hear. Taking God's message to the people who need it. And that's us. We all need God's word every single day. And the primary functions of this prophetic role is to edify, exhort, and comfort. This means that it's going to help us. It's going to encourage us. It's going to challenge us to live out our faith. Provide comfort during tough times. And people who operate in this prophetic offer often do receive divine insight and revelation. And I've witnessed it in my own life. Prophet uh, Agabus, in the book of Acts, predicted famines, Paul's imprisonment, and offered guidance, took the word of God, the spoken word of God, into a situation for encouragement and comfort. Prepared Paul for what was to come. Another important role even that prophecy has is in confirmation. 
How many times as a local church, we've experienced God confirm a word that he's already speaking to us through individuals and the church. Sometimes it's even validating personal callings. And we see that in Acts chapter 13, the Holy Spirit spoke through the leaders in the church in Antioch to set apart Barnabas and Saul for a special mission. A directive confirmed by God through the Holy Spirit spoken to the people. The prophet, the messenger of God, delivering a message from God. Delivering a message from God. And this word prophet, the Greek term for prophet is a whole bunch of squiggly lines. It means prophetess. I'll put it in the notes and send it. But it means to speak forth by divine inspiration. And so we have divine inspiration. And it appears 144 times in the New Testament, emphasizing its significance to speak forth the divine inspiration, the divine word of God into situations. The Hebrew equivalent is Nabi, which means a spokesperson or speaker. And this particular word means to one who speaks for God. So it's a spoken word of God by divine inspiration spoken by a person for God. And when Jesus even mentions in Matthew 23, 34, he says, I am sending you prophets and sages and teachers. And he goes through this whole list and he acknowledges that this ministry would continue, that the prophets would face many persecutions, that this, this whole office even suffers often because sometimes of the misuse of it, but sometimes the misunderstanding of it as well. I mean, even in Acts chapter 2, verse 17 and 18, it's another powerful message that Peter was speaking. And he quoted Joel, a minor prophet. And he said, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Young men will see visions. Your old men will see dreams. Shows us that even this prophetic gift is not just for a person or a male, but for male and female, women and man, young and old. It's to be used by everyone because it's God speaking through his people, taking a message to people. This modern day prophet still plays a vital role in helping us grow spiritually. And I wanted to highlight a few areas in in like what I identify in scripture And what they exist for today and try and help. And I know this is quite a bit of a a teaching, but it is more of a teaching because hopefully we understand it clearly. But it's for spiritual growth and community edification. That's what the Bible's teaching us here is that it's for our growth as the body of Christ to help us understand and live out God's will. Prophetic words bring clarity, direction, and deeper insights. And we've seen it, 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 prophetic words help us address contemporary issues. And we saw that as a church, 2020, as COVID hit, we believe God spoke very clearly to us. And he said, feed my people. Feed. And as a local church, we waited up and we said, we believe God's speaking to us. How do we do it now? Because we don't have money. <laughs> we can't provide millions of meals. But God said, feed. And so we started to do it. And how many meals in the end? One point. One point million. (laughs) Just over a million meals were distributed because a word from God was spoken. And we didn't have the money to do it. So if we measured it against our circumstances, we would have said, nah, I don't think God's speaking. But we had to pray and ask, Lord, are you speaking to us? Is this a divine word from you, spoken from you to us through the Holy Spirit? And we saw God do amazing things. We know that prophetic words encourage us in times of trial. They often provide us comfort, speaking the word of God into a situation where people are struggling. Provides comfort. The spoken word of God. It helps us to understand that God's in control. And as believers, we are encouraged and we trust his sovereignty. Spoken words and, and the prophetic Often, often offers us guidance and direction. I'm not just speaking about, Shane, tomorrow you're going to drive a Nissan 370Z that's been souped up. 
But it's about shame. I believe God wants to use you. And taking the word of God and speaking it into your life. Not just because it feels good. Or it's like, well, how do I encourage someone? But believing and trusting in prayer. Asking God to speak through me to you. There's many challenges and controversies. And those are the difficult things that we have to work through as well. Is that we're well aware that there's many false prophets. And this often does present a significant concern. Many people who claim to speak of God and lead people astray. But that's just our responsibility to live out the word of God. As John even advises, 1 John 4 verse 1 says, Friends, do not believe every spirit, but test every spirit, every spoken word of God to see whether it is from him. So we mustn't get discouraged by the wrong, but simply just always, what is the measurement tool is to test everything. Encourage it. And sometimes even we have misinterpretation that can lead to confusion. Furthermore, sometimes we experience um, some church communities, and probably to an extent, sometimes even in my own life, um, a resistance to this prophetic ministry due to seeing a lot of abuses and misunderstandings. But it should just be an encouragement to us to say, how do we understand the biblical basis for prophecy better? Because I want to see it because it can make a positive impact. It can help as we study the Word of God to diminish the conflicts. But we also have to foster acceptance and say, Lord, speak to us through the people that you've placed around us. I know prophetic words are often instrumental in church revitalization. And bringing renewal and life. Speaking the word of God and the spoken word of God. I mean, we saw even in that COVID period, a time where everyone thought the church will just close down, how the church thrived. Didn't look full on Sundays. <laughs> no one was here, but the church was alive. The church was active. And prophecy has definitely helped me in my own personal transformation as well. The spoken word of God into my life, helping me walk closer with the Lord Jesus. But I want to provide us with um, just four simple ways that I think we can help foster and embrace prophetic ministry. And one of those is just to cultivate prophetic environments. And I know that sounds, when we say prophetic, it always sounds intimidating almost, but it's to create spaces in your life group, in your friendships, in your space of influence, to pray for one another. To trust God to speak. Because God wants to speak. He wants to speak to his people. But we have to create space to listen. So it's not always going to be expressed through a Sunday service. It often won't be probably. But it will be spoken through your lives. We created a space uh, last month in the first week of May. Um, we went for 10 days in this organization. We took people into a very, very, very remote area in Zambia. And so it was so many things went wrong. Um, but we just saw God's hand in all of it. It's like, for us, it went completely against what we had planned. What we had planned. But God did amazing things. But one of the evenings, we just said, let's just be quiet and let's just spend 20 minutes. Like, let's pray. Let's pray for one another. Let's encourage one another. And let's create an environment where we can trust the Lord to speak through us. And many little words were spoken to each other and people were very encouraged. And one word came, and uh, this comes to my next two encouragements, is to establish accountability and spiritual discernment. Is we need accountability, especially in speaking prophetic words, because we can either validate or destroy someone. But we also need discernment because we need to understand and weigh it against the word of God. Is that, is this what God is speaking for his people? One guy came through and he said to one of the guys that was there, he said, you know, like, I really, I feel like the Lord wants to speak to you. And so can, can I? We're like, sure, let's, let's test it. Let's hear. And he says, man, I really want to encourage you. I, I, I feel like God wants to use you in big ways in leadership in the future. And this guy was like, wow, thanks, man. Like, I'm really trusting the Lord and I'm, I'm doing everything I can to, to go in that. I want to serve God. And this guy was like, cool, thanks. And he says, yeah, but I just want to say, like, the Lord says that you're not this failure that you think you are. And afterwards, this guy came to me and he goes, sure, that was difficult. <laughs> He's like, I didn't think it was this big failure, but, like, 
how do I receive that? And so even in, in that spoken word, is this opportunity for everything. Is One is that, okay, how do we weigh this up? Do we feel that this is what God's saying? I, I believe through knowing the person and seeing them really serve God that I do think God wants to use them in leadership. So I think, is the word necessarily wrong? No. But maybe the execution was a little, needs a little bit of tweaking. And so we went and sat with this guy and we said, yeah, like, let's encourage you, man. Because we either have the potential in that situation to see someone shy away from ever speaking again, feeling humiliated and destroyed, or to encourage and say, man, I'm being built up even in this process. Because I took a risk. Speaking the word of God is taking risks. It requires boldness of us to proclaim a message from God. Even, as, even just, uh, I'm not saying simple, but taking a scripture and proclaiming it to a person means risk. You risk rejection. You risk a whole lot of things. But you also, the good part about it for me is we have nothing to lose. And someone else has everything to potentially gain from a spoken word of God. But we have to always encourage humility and teachability. This is something that we can never forget or misunderstand is that we need to remain teachable. We need to create an environment where we foster growth until we all reach maturity and faith and that we, by then we'll be taken to the Lord. <laughs> Uncle Mike, you're not anywhere close yet. But I've seen Uncle Mike operate in prophetic many times. Speaking the word of God, Uncle Mike, you've been an example to me. And I love you, Uncle Mike, but you have been a good example. We need to trust the Lord. I want to show you one thing as I conclude this conversation, this sermon around prophecy. And I'm not prophesying, but I am in the same sense. I'm speaking the word of God because I want to see it root and take heart in our lives. I want to introduce you to someone. Her name's Jessica. And Jessica is this person over here. Now, I want to show you some of the things we go through as a music team and help you understand what you experience at times. So, Jessica, would you speak? How about song number two, Jessica? One. Two, verse two, three, four. And go to song number two, and she speaks again. Then we go to song number three. Oh, wow. Now, there's a reason why I'm showing you what Jessica does. Because I feel like it's very important to us. As a music team, um, we listen to Jessica. We gave her a name because... We just wanted to know who we're calling on. But we listen to Jessica. Jessica plays a vital role in our music team. And it's not the laptop. Before we used to, we, metronomes are an absolute, pivotal, incredible tool within the worship ministry, within music. And we need to all listen to her extremely well. Now, have you ever heard Jessica before? Haven't you? What do you hear? Music? Singing? The expression? The outward expression of what we have drilled into our ears permanently. For me, I was thinking about music because even uh, like as we've all, always been involved in music, there's a term that we'll use that we say, man, we're sitting in a pocket. Like, wow. Okay, we're sitting in the pocket now. And that kind of means for us is that like now we're all so well gelled that we are so tight that Jessica almost becomes part of our subconscious in what we're hearing that we're not even focusing on her anymore, but we feel her through what we're doing. And that for me is what, how we need to approach every gift, every single thing that we do. Because what comes out, what we express will only be from what we put in. And let me say, 
It's not Jessica that we need to be hearing and listening to permanently. But it's the word of God, the Holy Spirit, and the believers around us. We need to be meditating on the word of God day and night, day and night, asking the Holy Spirit, speak to us. Lord, speak to us so you can speak through me. Speak to me so you can speak through me. And even as we speak, as we sing, as you experience something very different, we don't ever switch her off. Because if we do, we have something that sometimes we fall out of time, out of beat. And it can mess up everything that we present. And the worst thing is even sometimes with her in our ears, we can still mess up. Because we're human. And we're fallible and we make mistakes. And that's the same as that we need to eagerly desire every single gift. Every single gift that God presents as a, as a present, in a sense, for the church. An expression for the church to thrive and flourish. But it will only ever come through our pursuit of them. What we do and what we express in a team comes through a lot of practice. A lot of pursuit comes through a lot of eagerly desiring, even when we make mistakes. And we do make mistakes. But it's our responsibility as a music team to always go, okay, in one sense, if you wanted to adapt 1 Corinthians 14 verse 1 where it says, pursue love, eagerly desire. It's, one of them says, earnestly desire, seek after continually the spiritual gifts. That's our responsibility. And so I know if, if we have to, by admission, say, how many of us are experiencing it? There's only one reason why not. We're not pursuing. It's not a criticism of the church, and it's an encouragement. I always say, and when we, we chatted to a, a young couple the other day, and they're experiencing some challenges. And I said, you know what? Look at them as opportunities to step into. Don't always look at it as, man, oh, shame. Oh. It's like, no. Man, if we're not experiencing this, let's step into it. But it's only going to come from every single one of us as the body of Christ saying, man, it's my job to pursue, to earnestly desire the gifts that God has in store for us as a church. And if we do that, we will see the church of God thrive and flourish, be built up, come to maturity but we do it in accountability, in teachability, in relationships, in fostering environments where we can grow and test and try things. But we have to step out. But we can only ever do that if the heartbeat of what we're doing, the click in our ears, is the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. It's not going to work outside of that. It's not going to work outside of that. We're not here to perform or just simply present we're here to live as a sacrifice before the Lord Jesus and allow him to use us. Whatever she calls, we do. Whatever God speaks, we need to do. And when we fall out of beat, step back into it. Step back into it and pursue and pursue and pursue. And I pray for you. Lord Jesus, we pray that um, even as we tackle a subject like prophecy, Lord. Lord, I pray that uh, many people in the church, Lord, would be encouraged. Lord, I pray that you would speak to many of us. Lord, through your messengers, but also through the spoken word of God. That it would divinely cut through bone, flesh, marrow. Lord, that you would challenge us. But Lord, that you would encourage us. Help us, Lord, to respond to you. And Jesus, I pray that everyone here that is struggling or feeling like maybe they're not seeing things function in their own lives, Lord, that they would just step into those gaps, Lord, and start to pursue and desire what you have for us. Help us, Lord Jesus, to be the bride that you want us to be. Help us, Lord Jesus, to shine bright in a dark world. Help us, Lord Jesus, to pursue all that you have for us so that your church can come to maturity, that your church can be built up, comforted, strengthened, 
for not only your name's sake, but for this community's sake. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi there. We hope you were so impacted by this sermon. If you need any further support, whether that's just someone to chat to, or maybe you have a specific a situation that you would like us to be praying over, you can visit our website, thebarn.co.za, or you can click the link in the description below. If you would like to dive into some more resources from this sermon, we release our 8 Minutes to Chew On podcast every single week. And this is a really cool resource where in just 8 minutes, we go into the practical application of this sermon, what that looks like in your life. And so to access that, you can just get it here on our YouTube page or wherever you listen to your sermons. Lastly, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel and turn on your notifications so that you know when we post. We'll see you next week.